Okay, so I guess I'm I'm the I'm the very last one, uh, <laughs> uh, keeping you from taking your shuttle uh, back. Um, so I'll try to be on, stay on time, and I think I have a few extra minutes, maybe. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, so when I when I prepared this talk, I think I was a little ambitious. Um, I had these two parts to it. Um, I may not get to the second one, but um, uh, but let's see how it goes. Uh, it may depend on your some you know well formulated questions that may help get me to that uh, the end. Um, but okay, so um, uh, so I'll talk about these you know exotic states of matter, uh, which we have a fairly good uh, conceptual understanding of and. Thanks to the organizers, we have heard some uh, very nice conceptual talks, but we've also heard experimental talks as well. Um, and this is uh, sort of um, an attempt uh, to try to draw that connection, uh, try to find ways of uh, actually realizing these ex exotic states, um, you know, paying attention to energetics um, or to uh, preparation protocols. Uh, and in that process, maybe we understand a little bit more about these uh, states as well. And, and get them closer to the experimental realm. Okay, so the first part will be about um, creating uh, anions uh, in Moray uh, systems. Uh, and I should acknowledge my collaborators, especially uh, these people, Dan Parker, Junkai, uh, Islam, and uh, Patrick. Patrick is here. Uh, he's the quiet one in the back. Um, uh, and um, uh, we've had some very nice collaborations with Mike, uh, Zalta's group, uh, DMRG, as well as um, uh, experimentalists. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> uh, so really I'll, I'll be uh, focusing on uh, more materials uh, and trying to realize these states called fractional uh, churn insulators. Um, so fractional churn insulators are really kind of the missing box over here. Um, so when you apply a magnetic field, uh, you can realize many exotic states. Uh, people have done this since the 80s. Uh, the integer and fractional quantum Hall effects, this is the really exciting uh, state of matter. Um, and uh, more recently, people have tried to uh, realize the same kind of physics without the need for strong uh, magnetic fields by filling electrons uh, in a band, uh, in a churn band, uh, even in, in the absence of a magnetic field, you can realize the integer uh, quantum mole state. So these are some very nice experiments done here uh, in Andrea Young's group uh, in magic angle graphene, a moray material. Um, it spontaneously breaks uh, time reversal symmetry. It picks a valley, it picks a spin, uh, and you end up getting the quantum hall state. You get the quantized um, hall conductance. Uh, and you didn't need to apply a strong mag magnetic field uh, to do that. Question is, can you do the same for the fractional quantum Hall effect? Okay, and um, uh, those are fractional churn insulators. Um, uh, and there are many reasons to look for them. Um, uh, one of them is similar to this, that maybe we can realize the physics of fractional quantum Hall effect without the need for strong uh, magnetic fields. So as a practical issue, uh, it's very nice. Um, you could also get very high energy scales. Usual fractional quantum Hall effect, you're limited by the magnetic field you can apply here. It could be microscopic scales. Uh, you could maybe combine it with superconductivity. Um, uh, many, uh, many advantages. Um, I'll also try to argue it's a new state of matter. So realizing a fractional churn insulator with or without a, a magnetic field is, uh, is interesting. Um, and it's, it's an old topic, uh, but it's kind of seen a revival because of uh, the experimental discovery of these more materials. You know, you, once you see a churn insulator, it's, it's kind of a, a, good, um, a good sign um, that you may be able to realize these fractional uh, churn phases as well uh, by partially filling these churn bands. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean when I say it's a new state of matter, uh, also to give you a bit of orientation uh, what these um, uh, experimental signatures of a fractional churn insulator would look like. Uh, so let's say you have a churn band, like for example, in that experiment I showed, uh, you spontaneously break time reversal, you have this churn band, you completely fill it, you get a churn insulator. Um, and um, uh, the way you can see it is you can apply a magnetic field and to keep it insulating, you'll have to change the density of electrons. Okay, and that's equivalent to the uh, Hall conductance, the Strader relation uh, relates the density of electrons. This is measured in number of electrons per unit cell. I'm thinking of a periodic system. 
uh, so I have a discrete translation symmetry. Uh, you relate it to the magnetic field. Again, the magnetic field is written in terms of magnetic flux quantum per unit cell. Okay. Uh, and there's a linear relation, and this, uh, this uh, number over here is the hall conductance, basically. So if you had a churn insulator, you, you, you fill this churn one band, uh, you'll find that this is a line that is slope one because it has hall conductance one. Okay, but in a periodic system, you also have another contribution, which is an offset. Switch off the magnetic field, you have a finite filling of electrons. Uh, you want to take that into account. Uh, and fractional churn insulators, they are, they kind of show up in both of these integers, uh, sorry, in both of these um, uh, quantities. So for example, you, you partially fill this churn one band, one third, let's say. Uh, you could end up getting a fractional churn insulator. So the filling is one third at zero magnetic field and it has a slope. Uh, and the slope is a fraction as well. Uh, that, that's a sign that this is a, uh, your fractionalized excitations. Uh, and these kind of um, slope and intercept correspond to a fractional churn insulator. Uh, you see it's different from a fractional quantum Hall effect, which would not have this offset. Okay, so the offset is important. If you have translation symmetry, uh, you've managed to create a state which has one third filling of electrons per unit cell without breaking any of the symmetries, any of the translation symmetry. Uh, how did you do that? Well, you, you have these Laughlin quasi-particles with fractional charge, uh, and you can take them and bind them to the sides of the lattice, uh, and uh, that is really the state that you're realizing in this FCIs, in these fractional churn insulators. Uh, it's a, uh, it's topological order, it's got these fractional excitations, uh, but there's a translation symmetry enrichment that allows you to distinguish it from the fractional quantum Hall effect, which has the same topological order. Okay, so when you have translation Symmetry, you can tell these two apart equivalently just by looking at these lines, the slope and the intercept. You can tell it apart from a fractional quantum Hall state. Okay, so it'll be really great to get these at zero field, but in fact, if you have translation symmetry, you can uh, meaningfully distinguish a fractional churn insulator from the fractional quantum Hall effect, even in a magnetic field. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> uh, so one big distinction from churn insulators is that you know, if you have a churn band, you may have to break time reversal to get it and so on. Uh, you may have to break it spontaneously. Uh, but once you fill that churn band, you just have a churn insulator. There's no further requirement. So band topology gives you the churn insulator. It's very robust. For a fractional churn insulator, you're thinking of fractionally filling the churn band. Um, but you need the interactions to do the rest. You need the interactions to create this fractional state. Uh, and for that, it's going to be, it's, it's not sufficient that you just have some churn band. Um, just specifying the topology is not important. Exactly what the wave functions are doing uh, in this band is going to be important as well. Um, and what we'll try to do is to, you know, identify um, some physically well-motivated requirements um, that will help us realize the FCIs. Okay, now, of course, this may be too good to be true that you just think of something and you say, oh, we're going to get FCIs. Uh, so eventually we'll have to extend this with numerics uh, if you want to talk about a realistic system. Uh, but doing numerics in the absence of this kind of motivation is, is, um, is pretty hard. Uh, uh, and we'll see that there are some things we can understand about the energetics uh, to kind of move us um, uh, in a uh, you know, sort of in an optimal uh, direction. Okay, so again, this is a somewhat old problem. So the early days, what people try to do is to mimic Landau levels. That we know we get fractional quantum Hall states there. Let's try to do everything possible to make our churn band look exactly like a Landau level. Okay, um, so you know some of the things that you can require. So Landau levels are famous for being completely flat, no dispersion. Uh, they also have translation symmetry, uh, so they have everything is pretty uniform. So the Berry curvature is pretty uniform in the momentum space. So you could try to engineer this in your churn band. Uh, it turns out this is not going to be enough because this is a property of the lowest Landau level, of course, where we see the fractional quantum Hall effect, but it's also a property of every Landau level. Okay, so you go to some high Landau level, you don't even have to go very high, uh, you, just, you stop seeing the fractional quantum Hall effect. Okay, at least if you use Coulomb interactions or some short range interactions, keep the interactions fixed, the higher Landau levels with these properties, they don't support the fractional quantum Hall effect. So there's something else, some other crucial ingredient that's there. Uh, and people sort of identified what is that, what is you know, special to the lowest, uh, lowest Landau level, not there in the higher ones. Um, 
and it goes under the name of the trace condition. Um, so I won't go into too many details about this because I'll, I'll be using a different viewpoint. Uh, but roughly speaking, it's, there's a, a quantity related to the band called the quantum metric. Uh, and it's, it's pretty similar to the Berry curvature. And the Berry curvature you get by taking overlaps of wave functions. You take derivatives with respect to momentum, take the overlaps. Um, this is also a different overlap. It gives you the quantum metric. Uh, and if you have a point by point identification of the two, they match every point in momentum space. Uh, that's called the trace condition. Yeah, and this is something that the lowest Landau level satisfies, uh, but not the higher Landau level. So if you can engineer this as well, along with the uniform Berry curvature, uh, then you have basically mimicked both the Berry curvature of the lowest Landau level and the quantum metric of the lowest Landau level. Okay, so you've really you know, found something that looks a lot uh, uh, like that. And in fact, you can make it more precise. You can recover the so-called GMP algebra, which is just an algebraic way of setting up the quantum Hall effect, uh, and you will get the fractional churn insulators. Yeah, but uh, uh, one perspective is that this is actually very hard to achieve. If I really give you a, uh, something that's not a Landau level, it's very hard to, to get there. Um, and uh, so, so the main point of the talk is that there is a, a weaker condition that you can impose, uh, which gets you very far uh, and is much easier to realize. Okay, and uh, we'll uh, which is basically going to be this trace condition. We're only going to require this um, <clears throat> uh, and, and not the others, not, not for example, the uniform Berry curvature. Uh, and we'll see that, you know, you can, uh, it's a good place to look for FCIs. Uh, it's easier to realize. Uh, one of the nice things is that it's not completely the lowest lambda level, so you might get some new physics as well. Um, and, uh, you know, so, um, uh, so that's something we'll also explore. Okay, so, um, so this is a pretty abstract looking condition. Uh, what we'll try to do is uh, we'll try to introduce a different looking condition, which is much more physical. Uh, we'll eventually show it's the same as this one. Okay, and we'll call that other uh, condition vortexability or uh, uh, a band that has that condition will be called a, a vortexable band. So most of this talk will be about you know, uh, uh, discussing this, uh, this condition. Okay, so uh, we'd like to understand the physical meaning of this vortexable condition um, and why it's important to realizing FCIs. Um, can we find bands that naturally have it, have this property? Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about experiments and finally talk about beyond the Landau level, you know, which uh, bands that have that property but are not like uh, the Landau, or they differ from the Landau levels in some, in some um, uh, significant ways. Okay, so what is this condition, the physical condition? It's very, it's very simple to state. Uh, say you have a churn band uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, pick a wave function in that band. Uh, you can think of it as some linear combination of the block wave functions, if you like. It's just some, some particular wave function in that band. Okay, and uh, so the, the wave function belongs to that particular band, and then what I want to do is I want to multiply it by z. Okay, x plus i, y, just multiply it by the coordinate z. Okay, so, um, so that, when you do that, you, what you effectively do is you attach a vortex to your system. Okay, so a, a, a vortex at the origin, the phase factor that it picks up, uh, that it imparts to the, uh, the electron is simply this, uh, is z, right? Um, so z times psi is just um, a wave function that differs from the original one by the attachment of a vortex. Okay, that's why we call, we, we have this vortexable over here. Uh, and a band is vortexable if this, when you do make this product, the state remains in the band. Okay, so you could have, you know, generically when you do that, take some wave function multiplied by, you know, attach a vortex, you would expect it would maybe have some projection in the same band, but also spill over into the other bands. Okay, and if, if that happens, it's going to have, it's going to pay an energy cost. Uh, this new state will be energetically expensive because you're going to make this fragments in the other bands. Uh, but if you have the situation where everything remains in the same band, um, that's when we'll call it a vortexful band. Okay, so a bit more formally, you can define a projector <clears throat> uh, into this particular band, or you, and you can also define its complement projector into everything else. Uh, so what we're saying is you pick a state in that band, so the projector brings it back, and then you multiply it by z, and it, and it remains uh, in that band. Okay, equivalently, you multiply it by Q, 
Q times Z psi uh, is zero, there are no fragments that go outside the band. Okay, so that is the definition of vertexability, and once we have this, you know, we can, we can just, um, uh, you know, derive its consequences. Okay, so why is it good for FCIs? Okay, uh, that's the first question. So you can make some simple manipulations. If you can, uh, if this band is vertexable, Z times Psi is, uh, there's no component outside. But then you can iterate this, so Z to the N also remains in the band. So any function of Z remains in the band, right? Um, you can extend this to many body wave functions. Um, so imagine you have now Psi a function of many coordinates multiplied by any analytic function of all the coordinates, um, this whole thing is going to remain in that band. Okay, again, so no energetic penalty for multiplying by any analytic function. Okay, so this is really great, actually, because uh, given a many-body uh, state, what you can do is uh, you can pick a particular um, polynomial to multiply by, which is this one, familiar one from uh, you know, fractional quantum model physics, zi minus zj to the power of 2s. You multiply that into the filled band wave function. Okay. Uh, this is a state that lives entirely within this vertexable band. Nothing is going out. Um, and uh, so this is actually the wave function for a fractional churn insulator. You can check that it has the right density. It's a liquid, just like you can do for the, uh, when you think of this as being the fill lambda level and this being the Jastro factor that gives you the Lofton state. Yeah, and in fact, if you pick a short range interaction, uh, imagine you're at filling one third, S is equal to one. Uh, you pick a short range interaction, um, <clears throat> like this derivative of the delta function, uh, look at the expectation value of this interaction in the state at zero. It's positive definite interaction, expectation value is zero, so this is a ground state uh, of a problem where the Hamiltonian is entirely interactions of this kind. Here's the same argument that, you know, people, Trugman and Kielsen gave for why the Lofton state is the ground state with short range interactions that holds for this one as well, um, you know, uh, because of this property of being vortexable. And you assume that the interaction is just this uh, short range interaction, no kinetic energy, for example. Yeah, and the physics is just, of course, you're attaching vortices to particles, you have some short range interaction that dies off very rapidly, there's very little bit of the wave function at the origin because it's kind of spinning around because it's vortex. Okay, so that's why it's good to have a vortexable band. It's not everything. You need the other things to happen as well, but uh, it's, a, it's a very good starting point. Okay, so let me make a, a just a slightly technical uh, slide how to relate this physical kind of picture to more uh, mathematical conditions that are equivalent. So the trace condition we said, uh, this is how it was originally formulated, but you can see that these are actually the same. There's another condition that you can formulate in momentum space, which is if you have a vortexable band, um, if you um, look at the periodic part of the block wave function, so u is a function of k, kx and ky, you can actually find a gauge where it's a function only of the holomorphic combination, just kx plus i ky, and not of the difference. Okay, so, uh, so all of these turn out to be equivalent. Uh, I won't prove all of them. I'll prove the easiest one. Actually, I won't even prove it. I'll just um, kind of argue uh, why this might be true. For example, this one, if I have this property, if I tell you that it's, uh, the, I can find the periodic part of the block wave function, I can, I can give it to you in, in, in this holomorphic form, uh, you can go back to this condition. Uh, and it's kind of easy to see, or at least uh, to um, you know, to be, um, uh, <clears throat> to guess how this could happen. Uh, so this is holomorphic, so you take the derivative with respect to the anti-holomorphic coordinate, it vanishes, but this derivative d by dk bar is kind of like multiplying by z, right? You go between k and, and, and coordinates, d by dk bar is like multiplying by z, and you get it all right, then you put the psi over here, not the u, but the psi, uh, and you get the, the condition for vortexability. Okay, so that way you can do it. Um, if this is satisfied, you can also show the trace condition is satisfied. Uh, but actually before that, let, just skipping a little bit ahead, we're gonna talk about the wave functions and magic angle twisted by layer graphene. Uh, in, the, in a particular limit called the chiral limit, you can actually solve for the wave function. <clears throat> and this is what the wave function looks like in an appropriate gauge. The, the periodic part of the block wave function only depends on the holomorphic k. 
it's got all kinds of stuff happening. It's got some special functions, sigma function, but the dependence on K is only through the holomorphic part of, of K. Okay, you can also get this trace condition. Um, so again, I'm, I'm just um, uh, kind of suggesting how it might be true. This difference, the trace of the metric minus the very curvature, turns out you can equate it to this norm of a vector. Uh, so it's always bounded from below by zero. Um, and this is saturated if this, if this thing vanishes. Okay, and this thing vanishes for a vertexable band. Easiest to see if this U is actually just a holomorphic function of K then this derivative is zero uh, and this equality holds and then you get that the, the metric is equal to the uh, Berry curvature. Okay, it's, it, it's true otherwise as well, even if I pick a bad gauge, it's just harder, it just makes life harder for you to show that. Okay, so this is the connection between this vortex ability and these momentum space things, which if you didn't, weren't interested in that in the first place, that's, that's, uh, that's fine. Okay, so this is what, what it implies, why it's important, but can we find bands that, that naturally uh, give you this vertexable, uh, have this vertexable character? Okay, so it turns out the answer is yes, uh, and there's a very simple principle. Um, so imagine that you have a band, a flat band, uh, which is, uh, comes about from the zero mode equation. Okay, so many bands like that, that, uh, or maybe not many, but there are bands like that where you solve a zero mode equation. So this is not Hermitian. This is some, you have a Hamiltonian, you're trying to find zero energy state, but you can simplify that calculation by just looking for a zero mode. Um, so the zero mode operator has this particular form. So there's a linear derivative with respect to Z bar. Okay, and something else, some other operator over here does not depend on, the, there is no derivatives, right? So if you set it up like this, uh, then it's easy to show this band that you get is vertexable. Uh, it's kind of trivial. You just take your wave function psi and multiply it by z. If psi was a solution to begin with, so is this product. Okay, so if you got your band like this, it is vertexable. And it's a very simple example of that is just the lowest lambda level. Lowest lambda level is a zero mode of this Hamiltonian, um, Dirac fermion in a magnetic field. Uh, you can write this down as a zero mode equation where this A is literally the vector potential, the AX plus I A Y. Okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, you know, why is the lowest lambda level vertexable? This may be the simplest way of, way of showing that. Okay, but um, that we knew. Um, actually, you can also use inhomogeneous magnetic fields over here. Uh, that's another vertexable band. Um, but let me give you two other examples, less obvious. Um, turns out that this magic angle graphene, if you twist it, of twisted bilayer graphene, um, at, at the magic angle, if you take the chiral limit, and the chiral limit, you just drop all hoppings that are not between opposite sublarices. Okay, so there are such hoppings in the realistic model, uh, but you just throw them away, you get the chiral limit, uh, and then again, the flat band, you get perfectly flat bands there. You get very flat bands for the realistic, you know, this tries a McDonald model, but here it's perfectly flat, and again, it's because it's a solution, turns out it's a solution of a zero mode equation. Okay, and just that fact tells you that it's a vortexable band. Okay, so you have these churn bands, they, are, they also have a valley and a sublattice index. So you pick a valley and pick a sublattice, you get a churn band, churn one, uh, and it's vortexable because it's the solution of the zero mode equation. Uh, another example, actually quite interesting, is to take these chirally stacked multilayers. Okay, so you started with a twisted bilayer, but instead of just bilayer, you can have a stack of graphene layers. They should be chiral in the sense that um, when you go from one to the other, there's a particular stacking arrangement that you've got to follow. Um, and you can take N of one stack, twist it against M of the other. Okay, and again, go to this uh, special limit, you go to the chiral limit, throw away all same sublattice hoppings, uh, it turns out they have the same magic angle, uh, and you end up getting churn bands, which are, um, are flat, uh, also vortexable, turns out because they're zero modes, uh, but they end up having carrying churn number greater than one. In fact, you can get any churn number you want by taking different numbers of these tanks. So you get a, a, a band which has a churn number different from one and which is vortexable. Okay, so we can go there and see what kind of interac interaction physics uh, you get. Okay, so um, so we did that. So what, what about experiment? 
Okay, so uh, um, so let's just review the experiments on uh, which have um, talked about fractional churn insulators. Um, so the first one actually is uh, probably this one by Andrea uh, a few years back. Um, so this is, um, they, they see uh, fractional churn insulators in Hofstadter bands. Okay, this requires a little bit of explanation. Um, the bands, the churn bands themselves are created by magnetic field. This is a little bit different from what we were thinking. You know, zero field, you get some churn band and you, and you fill it partially. Here the churn bands themselves require a strong magnetic field to create. You know, the, the, the field is, uh, is of order like 20 Tesla or 30 Tesla. Uh, so in the high field regime, um, but we said there is a way to identify fractional churn insulators by looking at the slope and intercept, and that's what they did. Uh, and they saw that in these Hofstadter bands. Um, but you may hope for something that's at weaker field, um, partly because of the other motivations. Um, and in fact, more recently, uh, there was this experiment from the Amiri Akubi and Pablo group. Uh, so this was magic angle graphene. Uh, it's believed to be aligned with a uh, HBN substrate. So, uh, so it bring, puts it in the same class as these um, examples I gave in the beginning, uh, where a churn insulator was seen in magic angle graphene at a particular filling, filling three, uh, where you spontaneously saw this churn one state being formed. Okay, so they went and looked at such a sample very carefully using a scanning probe, so you can look at parts of the sample which are in better shape than others. Um, and they do these compressibility measurements, so they go and identify lines of incompressibility. Okay, and what they see is that there is this churn insulator line, the one, uh, the, there's a filling of three, um, it's just some integer, uh, but this is basically the churn insulator, it goes down to zero field. Uh, but then they can also identify these other lines uh, which have the slope and intercept relevant for these fractional churn insulators. Okay, so they see that um, uh, in these systems. Um, I mean, of course, it would be wonderful to have more experiments. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit surprising uh, is that it requires some field uh, to stabilize this, uh, but not a very large field. So, uh, you know, it, uh, this is a, a field which is a, a fraction, one quarter or one fifth, of the magnetic field you would, you would have needed to get a fractional quantum Hall effect at the same density. Okay, so this physics is giving you a boost, um, but why do you need this field at all? Could it be at zero field? As it, there seems to be some other state that intervenes uh, at, uh, at zero magnetic field. Okay, and uh, so we looked into this a little bit. Uh, the fact that these are originating from these vertexable bands we think is helpful. That's uh, part of the story we think why this becomes a good place to look for uh, fractional churn insulators. And in fact, this was sort of anticipated in theory, at least the fact that this is a good place to look uh, was anticipated in theory before the, the experiments. Okay. <clears throat> okay, but there are many complications here. Thus, uh, you need a small magnetic field. Um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, why is that? How does, where does that come in? Um, so one of the reasons we believe is that these bands are not that flat uh, because of interactions with the other electrons, electrons that are filling, uh, that are in the filled bands, you end up getting a dispersion. Dispersion has a peculiar feature that is very steep around a few K points. Okay, so the, the bandwidth looks quite big, but most of the bandwidth is coming from a small part of momentum space. Okay, so when you put on a magnetic field, you get Landau, uh, Landau levels, and you can do a semi-classical calculation, tells you this bandwidth is going to collapse with a very small field. Okay, basically, the effective mass is very light, so the cyclotron frequency is large, and the zero-point energy of these Landau levels is large. So it just kind of collapses with a small field. And we think at least that's one of the things driving this uh, physics. Also, the band geometry improves. Uh, it's not completely... Uh, ideal, um, and it improves in a small field. So we had some theory calculations suggesting around a few Tesla, like three Teslas, where you would get the fractional churn insulators, which is not too far from the experiment. Here, yeah, this is a combination of theory and numerics, which actually did DMRG on fairly realistic models. Uh, but I think it's still fair to say there are a lot of aspects about twisted by layer graphene modeling that we are not, uh, we are not very certain about. So uh, this is kind of an evolving story. Okay, one of the questions we asked ourselves, is it possible to get zero field fractional churn insulators? You can just do the numerics in this model, DMRG numerics. 
Uh, and one thing we seem to find is that if you go to slightly larger angles, usually larger angles you get more dispersion, but it turns out that more, dis more of that dispersion contracts this one, and at least in the numerics we were finding zero field fractional churn insulator. It's not been seen in the experiment as yet, but I think that's a nice goal to, to, to drive for. Okay, so that was the experiment. Uh, finally, let me just say a few words about going beyond Landau level physics. Um, uh, and one way to go beyond is to look at these chiral stacks where you get churn numbers that are different from one. Okay, so what is the fractional quantum Hall effect? Uh, what does fractional filling of these higher churn bands look like? Um, and a simple example, which actually has already been looked at in experiment, is the so-called mono bi. You have two layers, a bilayer twisted against a monolayer. And if you put it in these formulas, you get that you'll get two bands, one is churn two and the other is churn one. Okay, of course, opposite churn numbers in the opposite values. So what if you were to partially fill this churn two? And that was actually uh, explored in this experimental paper. Um, and so we looked at some theory, again, in this very ideal limit. Uh, uh, the simplest thing you can do is to take this churn band, forget about spin and fill it, half fill it. Okay, so it's a little bit like a quantum hall ferromagnet problem. You have two parts to it, spin up and spin down. Uh, you can think of decomposing churn two into uh, you know, two flavors, if you like, uh, and you end up getting a generalized ferromagnet. You get an insulator, um, and uh, it has churn one, uh, and the insulator has some particular, you know, it's basically some kind of charge density wave. Okay, so uh, you can think of the order as being along some sphere, just like a ferromagnet, but instead of being spin, different directions of the sphere actually correspond, for example, the Cartesian directions correspond to stripes, but the 111 corresponds to this kind of crystal. Um, so there's some evidence for, uh, you know, this kind of physics uh, in this experiment. Uh, they see a churn two band when it's fully filled, and then they partially fill it, so filling seven halves, uh, and they see an insulator which has churn one. Okay, of course, they don't know which of these it is, but very likely it's one of these. Uh, that's giving rise to this uh, churn insulator. Okay, that's very simple kind of quantum hall ferromagnet physics, but interpreted as, uh, as a CDW. <clears throat> you can try to be a little more uh, interesting, which is you have this whole sphere worth of ground states, and it turns out the anisotropies are very weak. Okay, so if you were to dope a little bit away from this churn one, uh, add charge, uh, it's quite likely that the charge doesn't go in as electrons, but as skirmions of this generalized ferromagnet, um, and then if you had a local probe, you'd be able to see it as, you know, the texture, the skirmion texture, which is the spin canting around the sphere, uh, will look like in different regions, you'll have stripe oriented in different directions, or this kind of pattern um, should be uh, more accessible than a spin skirmion, uh, because it's associated with these patterns. Okay, but all of that is sort of integer quantum hall type physics. What about fractional uh, quantum hall? So you can fractionally fill this churn two band, um, this is pure theory, of course. Uh, and you can ask, for example, at what filling do you get a translationally symmetric state? Uh, none of these CDWs. So it turns out if you're at one fifth filling, uh, you can get the, what's called the Halperin 332 state. Um, so you can think again, somehow there's like a spin physics to this. It forms a singlet that's known to be a spin singlet, which in the in this language means it's just, uh, you know, a featureless state, no translation symmetry breaking, uh, and you see some five ground states corresponding to this topological order. Okay, so the hope is maybe <laughs> somewhere here in this um, system, maybe improved with the magnetic field, you could see such a <coughs> fractional quantum all state. Okay, you can also get Laughlin-like states, but then you have to polarize the spin. Uh, so for example, at nuclear one sixth, you see a ferromagnetic uh, Laughlin state, um, and uh, the Laughlin gives you this threefold degeneracy. The ferromagnet gives you some huge degeneracy. Six, you know, this is uh, six electrons, so you'll get seven times three, 21 ground states, which, you'll, which you see all of them you see in this, these uh, numerics. Okay, so you get something that looks like a density wave, and then it has Laughlin physics associated with it. Okay, so there's interesting higher churn physics uh, uh, to be explored uh, starting, with, starting in this limit. Okay, so let me conclude. I think I'm out of time. Um, uh, so I introduced vortexability, and I think it's a very promising starting point for identifying FCI candidates. Uh, of course, this is, you know, I don't want to brush all of these physical caveats under the rug, very important. Um, we need to understand microscopic models, strain, substrate, et cetera. 
uh, but, but I think this is a good organizing principle. I talked about the very simplest kind of vortex ability that, that itself was, uh, took up my time, but there's a way to generalize it, which is what we did in this, one of these papers. And uh, the very simple way of saying how you generalize is you take this factor e to the ik dot r that we, we put in front of the uh, periodic block function. Actually, no one tells us it has to be a plane wave. All we need is this condition. Uh, and you can pick more general functions and that ends up giving you more general uh, vortex functions. Okay, um, so there's interesting higher churn physics to be explored whether you can get these non-abelian defects. We couldn't find a state like that, but maybe others, other people could. Uh, there have been a number of papers on FCIs and other uh, systems like TMDs um, and also in this periodically strained graphene. Uh, these aren't truly vortexable bands. They don't have a limit where they're vortexable, but they seem all nearly vortexable. So maybe there are reasons, you know, there, there's something there that one can extend to. And finally, it'll be really nice to try to get a zero field FCI. Uh, one of the ideas we had was that you can use relaxation uh, engineering, for example, in some of these multi-layers, the magic angle shifts to lower uh, lower values, and then you get more of this relaxation, and you could you know, get closer to this ideal value. Okay, but uh, that would be a nice uh, target for for experiment. Okay, maybe I'll I'll end over here. Thank you. Um, so uh, not very familiar with this low sender level trace condition, so this might be a bit of a naive question, but is there um, sort of an equivalent, or can you modify it to be a second Landau level where we know we have the really interesting non-abelian states? Is there like a similar trace condition for a second Landau level? Yeah, so if you just evaluate that trace condition, it, it's different between the lowest and the first. Uh, there's some integer that comes in that, that modifies that, that relation. Uh, you know, people of course do this trick where you just take the form factors in any Landau level and that just modifies the interactions. You just behave like it's the lowest Landau level but with some different interactions. So from that point of view, you might say that higher Landau levels are no different. But we want to stick with the physical form of the interaction. Like for example, short range interactions, totally repulsive. Uh, then it really singles out the lowest Landau level. And maybe the first Landau level is kind of a transition you know, I was reading somewhere there are like 80 uh, fractional quantum mole states in the lowest Landau level, about eight in the first one. Of course, the one that, the most popular one is in the first <laughs> Landau level, but uh, the five halves. But um, maybe there's some transition and then you get to N equal to three, I guess, and there are no fractional quantum mole states. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe there's something interesting for the first, for the first excited Landau level uh, that, yeah, I don't know what it is. Let me ask. Oh, okay. I mean, naive question, but is there such a thing as a composite Fermi liquid in churn bands? Yeah, yeah. I, I think is if you go to half filling, you'll see a composite Fermi liquid. You do. That's been yeah. looked at. Yeah. Um, I, maybe we should check that more carefully, but you see something gapless, and I would expect you get the composite Fermi liquid. Yeah. I just have a couple of clarifying questions. So when you multiply the wave function by a complex number, why is that equivalent to attaching a vortex to it? Uh, so multiply by a very specific complex number, z, right? <laughs> um, so, right. so imagine that you have, uh, yeah, let, let's think of a vortex. What does it do? Um, so you compare a wave function without a vortex and one with the vortex. Uh, every time the particle is at some angle with respect to the origin, let's say for the vortex of the origin, the phase is, is rotating, right? Uh, and what function gives that to you? Uh, Z will give that to you. You know, maybe just the phase, you know, just uh, Z divided by mod of Z would also give it to you, but Z is nice because it also regulates at the origin properly. Uh, actually, I had a slide which I had, there was an old paper by Feynman where he talks about vortices and superfluid helium, and he goes and multiplies his wave function by z, basically, to get a, get a variational uh, state for the vortex. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, Ashwin, to get the fractional churn insulators, you'll have to break time reversal. And is that happening because the system undergoes some magnetic transition as well? 
Correct, correct. Um, so even just regular churn, did you say fractional churn? Yeah, uh, even regular yeah, churn. Yeah, even regular churn. Yeah. Even regular churn. Yeah, let's go back to the experiment. Um, so there are many materials now where this happens. Um, uh, here's a very, uh, you know, close to a hard example, but there are many others. Uh, you can have these materials that are magnetic. Uh, so you know, they're they, artificially magnetic or some emergent magnetic? I mean, they're all sort of, you know, at the qualitative level, they're all like that, right? You have okay. some atoms that like to be magnetic, like to be ferromagnetic. Uh, they break time reversal, and then they modify the bands. You get a churn band. Here, it's more, it's all orbital, if you like. Um, uh, so you have, uh, you know, interacting system, uh, overall time reversal symmetric, but in a single valley, you have churn band, opposite churn band in the opposite valley. And then exchange likes to polarize in a valley. Um, and you end up valley polarizing and you get this, uh, and it's a churn band, so you end up getting uh, broken time reversal and this quantization. Um, yeah, so that is a prerequisite. Sometimes that fails and you may not get a, you know, uh, there are many other samples where people do not see this at the same filling. Um, so there's some details there that, you know, sample dependent details, maybe strain um, that is different where you fail to break time reversal. <clears throat> so does it matter that the magnetism is orbital or just in pure spin? Uh, of course, if you didn't have the magnetism, like you said, there's a symmetry reason not to, you will not get this. Um, but in systems where there is spin orbit, if you have spin magnetism, it will get transferred. No, graphene, not it, yeah, just graphene, it will spin. not work. Right. In graphene, at least a regular ferromagnet, just, you know, everything pointing up, will not transfer that into the orbital component very effectively. Yeah. Okay, so we go this way and then back there. Uh, thanks, Ashwin. Uh, two short questions. Is it useful to think about this idea of vortex ability for a collection of bands, like degenerate bands, and think about how the symmetry operation is just within this degenerate bands? That's the first question. And the second is, um, it seems like this could also be used for non churn like bands when there are not Landau levels, and if one includes interactions on top of this, what kind of symmetry broken phases emerge from uh, such kind of bands? Yeah, yeah, they're both very good questions. Um, so we have some work on this, like multi-band systems, uh, trying to define similar kind of metrics. It actually, we needed to do it for this case, where in this churn insulator, where you actually had to apply a magnetic field. Uh, so then you get into some kind of Hofstad of physics. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna quickly scroll through. Um, you get into some sort of Hofstad of physics over here. And then you get multi-bands. You often get this multi-band situation. Uh, so we did develop some of that. Maybe one can do more. Uh, churn zero vortexable bands, they turn out to be very singular. Um, and you know, maybe there's something useful uh, to do, but yeah, not obviously. Um, uh, hi, Ashwin. So it's uh, a little bit related to what Chandan asked. Um, so if one, if for a given model, there is one vorticeable band, is there a constraint on having more bands of the same kind? Like char number oh. can have, like they come in opposite signs, for example. So here. If you have time reversal symmetry. Right. Um, if you don't have time reversal symmetry, you just need the sum to vanish. It doesn't necessarily need to be exact opposite. Right. Right. So. Um, so is there such a restriction on vortex civil bands? I don't think so. Um, for example, Landau level Dirac particle, maybe that's a singular example, you know, uh, Dirac particle and magnetic field, there's just that one zero mode that is vortex, that's it. Now, of course, if you had two Dirac nodes, you'd get a pair, um, but then maybe that's asking for more, right? Um, Thank you. So um, I want to understand better how you think about the fractional states in the turn two band. So did I understand correctly, you used a kind of a terminology like the bilayer states, is that right? Yeah. So what's the, what's the precise connection between a turn two band and a bilayer? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's not the same. Um, so what you can do for ideal, these kind of ideal bands which have the vortexability uh, condition, you can sort of 
separated into two layers, um, but the, the two layers are not orthogonal. Um, so for some things you get SU2, let's say you do churn two, you get SU2 symmetry. For example, the ground states that I was showing in this higher churn, uh, if you, uh, they, they were kind of small, the uh, pictures, but um, you know, uh, actually I don't have the most important one, but uh, maybe I have it down here. Just give me a second. Uh, as I scroll through all the, ah, here we go. Um, so this is uh, in this churn to uh, quantum hall ferromagnet, you see they're all degenerate, uh, which is what you'd expect for a ferromagnet, mm -hmm. but the excited states are not classified by SU2. And that has to do with the fact that they are not orthogonal. But when you're looking at a zero mode, so this being not orthogonal has got to do with the fact that this orthonormality doesn't hold, the norms are kind of changing. But if the answer is zero, it doesn't matter that the norm is not changing. So here, because you have some contact interaction, zero mode, you get the symmetry, but not for the higher thing. So there's a partial analogy, but there's in the back of one's mind, there's this, you have to keep track of the fact they're not orthogonal. This decomposition in general is not orthogonal. I mean, can I think of it, is, is there like a limit if I have a churn two band where I could fold the bro one zone back so that I have two churn one bands? Is yeah, that, is yeah. That, that's, that's roughly, yeah. Okay. But if you also insist that each of those two churn bands are ideal in the sense that they're vortexable, then you get this non orthogonal. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, are uh, all your vorte vortexable bands, are they based on continuum K dot P models? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I wanted to say that. Uh, you know, for us, for example, if you start with this interaction, this, the short range interaction, and we want the, you know, the Laughlin state to be stabilized for that, the starting point is like, assumes a continuum model, right? And of course, it makes sense for Moiré because we're thinking of some continuum. Uh, you have the entire unit cell covered and, you know, the spaces, uh, you have to think of the space inside the unit cell. So if you're asking about tight binding, this setup is not very ideal for tight binding. And the way you treat tight binding then is to take the tight binding model and attach a vanier function to each side. Uh, and then do the, you know, then you get something that, which has support on the entire unit cell. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, tight binding is, if when you think about these short range interactions and so on, the tight binding is not that uh, useful. It's an approximation, right? Of course, band structure is always continuous. Uh, tight binding is an approximation. You just look at the size, forget about the Vanier state. Um, but here I'd say that, you know, it's actually better to think about, think about it in the continuum. Mm -hmm. So, so the, you know, there's theorems that forbid having exactly dispersionless band with, with a non-zero churn number and finite range hoppings. Does that, does that theorem make it harder to realize FCIs? Or? Um, you know, so f the, the FCIs ultimately, they have some range of stability, right? If you get everything perfectly, you have an exact solution. Uh, if you violate it by a small amount, it's some gap state that is phase of matter does not immediately die. Um, so these changes, if the dispersion is small, you're, you're fine, right? Um, sure. um, so the question is, will it be a huge effect, uh, which I don't think it will be. Uh, and at least these continuum models are good approximations to the actual band structure. You do get perfectly flat bands, right? Uh, of course, you're making a continuum approximation. So. If you went back to the atomistic picture of graphene layers twisted, you will get some some dispersion, but that, that's within the, uh, that's much smaller than the errors um, that you incur from everything else, from many other things. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, so I think Ashley had a question, is right? And then we'll take Adolf and then we check the watch. Yeah, so I had uh, three questions. So first of all, I think, yeah, but quick, Charles Kane, uh, it's related a bit to his question. The first part of my, you know, questions is um, what determines maybe, or what is known about the upper bound on the churn number um, in this case? Uh, after you were talking about churn, churn number two, but, you know, how, what is known about increasing it? Um, another question was uh, simply you show these charge density wave skirmions and I was just wondering 
it wasn't clear from the slide at least like what was the object that could be you know is the vector in that case and what space is it winding over to form the skirmishes and the third question was just in considering this vortex ability do you potentially have to concern yourself with possibly mappings from higher dimensional like toruses along the lines of the Teo and Kane topological classification of defects or not? So I think the first two I can answer the your first question was about higher churn what is known so some things like this ferro magnet you can do for you know you expect it in all these higher churn magnets say churn three at one-third filling and so on but the fractional states yeah we have done a little bit there are there are other people who worked on this problem as well but it's not very comprehensive one thing we'd like to find is something that is like a fractional quantum Hall state which is not a Halperin state which is you know fully symmetric if you want to get these genomes there are some conditions that you need to satisfy and we have not found a state like that so these so and actually you can get any churn number in these these stacks the second thing was about okay what is the space that we're talking about here yeah so this you know it's sort of this picture that we were referring to this churn two you can roughly think of it as a spin and churn one or bilayer and churn one and this is the direction of that bilayer spin but here it has a consequence about you know what is the actual you know instead of just being spin it's actually some you know order parameter in the in the density another way to think about this is another way to think of a vector so you're actually getting ordering at this your sort of period doubling and so that gives you three vectors sorry three real numbers at the three endpoints of X angle and Brillouin zone and that gives you a vector that's another way a more like Landau theory way of saying this either way you get this vector it's got very little anisotropy because of these arguments that I made before at least in this limit so if you add charge and if the stiffness is is what you'd expect for a ferromagnet the lowest energy excitation is a skirmia and then in different parts of the sample you get different you know kinds of orders over here so you'll make the center is like this and then it becomes a stripe in the X stripe in the Y stripe in the you know rotated directions the third one I'm not very sure about higher dimensions whether there's some analog that's an interesting question whether you go to 3d you think of some other kind of defect it's interesting but it's it's not as natural of course you know this is talking about complex wave functions the most natural thing is to attach vortex yeah so I was thinking along the lines of you could consider a 2d system and then have a point like defect that effectively introduces some phase required to characterize that point like defect so you actually end up realizing like hot hot insulator physics in that system for instance so you have to characterize the topology with that like three-dimensional topological invariant and that could be non-trivial even when your turn number is actually trivial I'll have to understand that better yeah but sounds interesting hi thanks for a nice talk I was wondering I'm trying to understand a little bit better the role of translations in this vortex ability because the the trans the trace criterion is formulating case space while your criterion is formulating real space and we know that there are non crystalline systems that can have a well turn bands and so I was wondering if there's a clear role yeah very good question yeah we have a section in our paper the which does exactly that that the advantage of this real space formulation is that you could talk about systems that do not have the usual translation symmetry like quasi crystal or something and you can extend it but yeah maybe we can talk more but we had we did think I had a second question which is does the vortex ability single out FCI's from other instabilities so yeah is it is it true that are there like is the FCI the the strongest instability well you know I put some things under the rug right I'm assuming a certain kind of interaction as well if you make that assumption short-range interaction just between the particles no dispersion then it does single out the FCI's 
you have a positive definite Hamiltonian which has the SCI state as the zero energy state. Uh, and these other states are not in the picture. So, yeah, thanks. Okay, so I suggest that we stop here. Um, so let's uh, thank Ashwin, all of the speakers, and our organizers particularly for the conference. <laughs>